ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد to proceed the best of speech is the speech of Allah azza wa jal and the best of guidance is the guidance of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worst of all affairs are those affairs that have newly been added into the religion that are external to it Every newly affair, every newly added affair in the religion is an innovation. And every innovation is a misguidance. And every misguidance is in the fire of hell. We gather tonight by the permission of Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ala, begin studying a new treatise. As uh, inshallah all of you have seen, the treatise that has been selected for this course is Al Qawaidu. Al-Arba, the four principles, by the preeminent scholar known as Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab ibn Sulaiman al-Kalimi, may Allah have mercy upon him. This uh, title was chosen because of a number of reasons. From amongst these reasons is that it is considered foundational, such that the knowledge found in it is knowledge of the fundamentals. In other words, all the Muslims need this knowledge, and those who already have it will benefit from the reminder. Number two, it is chosen because this particular treatise is in reality beneficial for those who have attained a certain amount of knowledge of the creed. And this is contrary to the belief that many people have that this is for the absolute beginning. Many people think that this particular treatise is for the absolute beginner in the science of Aqidah. This is step number one. In a sense, that is correct. But in another sense, the reality is that the people who will benefit the most are not going to be the absolute beginners. While they will benefit. But those who will benefit the most are those who already have learned the Tawheed. In other words, those people who have studied the likes of Thalathat al-Usul, the three principles, and the likes of Kitab al-Tawheed are going to be the ones who extract the most benefit out of this treatise. Why is that? Because in this treatise, the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, has chosen to teach based upon doubts and lies that are being spread by the enemies of Tawheed. While the beginner may not notice this, it will just seem that he is teaching four important principles. The one who has learned the Tawheed can detect what the author is doing in responding to and refuting these misconceptions and doubts being spread 
by the people of shirk. And this leads me to uh, a side note. It has uh, occurred to me that one of the very beneficial ways to help us gain mastery of this text is to conclude with assigning homework. After we finish each one of the four principles, we will conclude with assigning homework and the homework is going to be determine what is the doubt that the author was addressing? What is the misconception or doubt that is being spread by the people of shirk? The author was attacking, dismantling, and diffusing. Inshallah, for each one of these principles, make it a goal for yourself. That not only will you understand the principle, but furthermore, you will understand what was the reason, the motive behind the author working on it, the author teaching it and explaining it in the way that he did. And thirdly, the most important reason, or one of the most important reasons, this was chosen because of the status of its author, Sheikh Al Islam. Uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab is well known. He's a star in the world of knowledge. A beacon of light, if I may. Someone whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has caused his knowledge to spread far and wide. We suppose this is because of his sincerity and devotion to Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ala, such that Allah, Jalla fi ula, has blessed his knowledge. His knowledge has spread far and wide. It has been translated into many languages. His books are being taught around the globe in different languages. Class after class is starting, class is ending, another is starting. We finish one book, we start another, and so on and so forth, all around the world, all around the dunya. Students finish his books and they crave more of his knowledge. So they come back to take more only to find that the thirst and hunger for knowledge has increased and they keep coming back to his books. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has caused his da'wah to be a da'wah of healing, a da'wah of unification, a da'wah of light that abolishes the darkness, a da'wah of strength that abolishes weakness, a da'wah of bringing back the sound mind, abolishing mysticism and foolishness and fairy tales. It is a da'wah whose fruits we are enjoying today. From the most obvious of its fruits is the fact that the land of the two holy mosques, the land of Saudi Arabia, has become a beacon of guidance for the people of Islam from his time and until today. A land of safety for the Muslim, a stronghold of Tawheed, a land in which none other than Allah is being worshipped. If you travel all around the world, and perhaps some of you have, you will know for certain what I'm speaking about. You have seen it with your eyes. There is no other land on the face of the earth that can make this claim that none other than Allah is being openly worshipped. In Saudi Arabia, you will not find open grave worship. You will not find open worship of other than Allah. Rather, the entire country is based upon the statement, La ilaha illallah. In fact, I don't know of any other country on the face of this planet that has put that word, La ilaha illallah, on their flag. We ask Allah Jalla wa'ala, bless it, bless its rulers, increase them in guidance, increase them in strength, and that Allah defeat their enemies and the enemies of all the Muslim. And may Allah bless the remainder of the Muslim countries. Ami. This author, has indeed spread the knowledge of Aqidah in a way 
that few men in the history of Islam have. Although he is a man that has reached the level of mastery in many disciplines, for example, if you read his works in the discipline of tafsir, you will see that this man is at the pinnacle of the exegesis, the explanation of the Book of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. If you read many of his works, you see that this man has indeed reached a very high level of knowledge in many disciplines, mastery. But when it comes to aqidah, subhanAllah, for centuries, the ummah has not seen a man that has reached his level. Not only because of the amount of knowledge that he has attained and shared, but further, because he was a man of da'wah. You see, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala was very dynamic in his da'wah. He was not just a man to sit down and write books. Nor was he a man to write books and teach in the masjid. Rather, his da'wah was for all. He would be seen at the graveyards, debating with people, calling them to Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. He would be seen talking to the leaders of the ummah, the emirs, of the different tribes and areas, calling them to Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. Writing messages addressed to the leaders of different areas, sending them communication, letting them know exactly what the da'wah is, and refuting the claims of its enemies that are trying to tarnish it, disfigure its beautiful face. He was a man that put into practice, as far as we can see, statement of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِ اَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, this is my path. I call to Allah based upon knowledge, based upon insight. I and those who follow me. And exalted is Allah, and I'm not from the polytheists. And I believe, and Allah knows best, that from the many fruits of his da'wah is the spread of tawheed, pure tawheed, without shirk, beyond the boundaries of the Arabian Peninsula and into many countries all around the world, a matter that makes the hearts of the believers rejoice wherever they hear of its news and they hear of its success. And this is why people of Tawheed from the East and from the West are experiencing an affinity for the Shaykh, a love for him, for his works and for his da'wah. We ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to bless the works of the Shaykh for us and for the Ummah of Muhammad. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make his works heavy for him on the scales on the day that he meets Allah. And that Allah elevates his rank and gather us with him and with our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Jannat al-Na'im. Nonetheless, there is one more thing left to be said before we move on. And that is that the Shaykh has followed in the footsteps of the messengers. As far as we know, Allah Azza wa is his accountant. We do not praise anyone over Allah. And as such, it is a given. There's no way around it that there's going to be a campaign to smear the Shaykh, tarnish his name, a propaganda campaign to attack his da'wah with falsehood. Because never does a man call to Allah based upon the methodology of the prophets and then walk away unscathed by the tongues of the liars the pens, the fabricators. It is a must that any man who walks in the footsteps of the prophets and the messengers must get a share of what they faced. They were tested. May Allah's exaltations and peace be upon them with the lies of their, their enemies and the slander of their enemies, the enemies of Allah, beginning with the shaitan, moving down the line to his followers. Every truthful follower of the messengers and the prophets must experience the same. So do not be surprised if you've heard 
propaganda being spread about the sheikh. Do not be surprised if you see and meet people that have completely swallowed the lies that are being spread about him. Do not be surprised if you come across campaigns that are being supported and aided and perhaps even funded by certain entities that attempt to repel people from his da'wah and convince them that his da'wah is a da'wah of evil. And if I was to guess, I would guess that most of you have heard the word Wahhabi as, a, as an insult. It's, it's leveled at people as an insult, meaning that you are a follower of Muhammad ibn Abdi Wahhab. May Allah have mercy upon him. And uh, there is nothing uh, shameful about that term. Wahhabi, if you are uh, calling us Wahhabi because of the name of Allah al Wahhab, then Alhamdulillah. We all love Allah Azza wa Jalla al Wahhab, the gifter, the giver, the most gracious. And we are hoping for more and more hibat, gifts from Allah Azza wa Jalla. So affiliate us to Allah. We have no problem with that. And if you are affiliating us to this man, then we deem him to be from the greatest of the scholars of the Muslimi. We're not saying he's infallible. We're not saying he's never made a mistake in his life or never said anything that is incorrect. On the contrary, we believe regarding him, the same that we believe regarding all the imams of the deen, that they are men upon guidance, men that have spread the knowledge of the sunnah, but they are not infallible. The amount of khair and good that they have spread is far more tremendous than the mistakes, if any, that they have. So if you affiliate us with the imams of the Muslimin, then we also have no issue with that. And if you're attributing us to al Wahhabiya because we've read his books and we love his books, then what you're really complaining about is the contents of his books. And this is the real issue. This is where things get sticky for them. Why? Because when you read his books and you go through them, you realize they are nothing but chapter headings followed by ayat, verses from the book of Allah, from Allah's speech, followed by hadith, sunan, narrations from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes followed by the athar of the salaf, beginning with the sahaba radiallahu anhum and the Imams of the Millah, the Tabi'een and their followers. Very rarely he will mention something from one of the scholars. And perhaps equally rare is Sheikh al-Islam inserting some of his own speech. It is phenomenal. It is phenomenal that some of his books do not even include an introduction. Literally. He is so... hesitant to put any of his speech in his books to the point that some of his books do not include an introduction. The introduction is an ayah from the book of Allah. He will put the title of the book followed by an ayah from the Quran. Most famously, Kitab al-Tawheed wa qullahi ta'ala wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal ins illa li'abudun. It is amazing. The amount of respect the awe he has or shows towards the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and the ayat in it and the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the wisdom find, found in it shows and shines through his works. And this is why one of the best arguments you can make defending his da'wah, defending the shaykh towards anyone that attacks it is to say bring me the issues that you are talking about from his books. Show me where the issue is from his books. And the answer obviously is they will not be able to. So with this being said, um, 
we begin, inshallah, tonight with our reading from Al Qawaid Al Arba. Asking Allah. By His beautiful names and His lofty attributes to make this a blessed course of study. One that brings us closer to Allah. One that results in beneficial knowledge. But Allah Azza wa Jal grants us the ability to put into practice. One that causes us to gain the strength to call to it, to call to that which we have learned and benefit others through it. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيز We begin with the statement of the author. May Allah have mercy upon him. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful, it is He whose aid we seek. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, means that we begin in the name of Allah, or I author or I write this book in the name of Allah. This is a word that is said by the Muslimin in the beginning of a lot of their endeavors. A word that they have inherited from their messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they say in following of his sunnah. And the scholars of Islam explain that it is kalimatu sti'ana. Why? Why do we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? It is kalimatu sti'ana. The word you say to seek help from Allah. And then he said it is only Allah's help that we seek. Knowing that he seeks the help of Allah, beginning with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and it is only Allah whose aid he seeks. And this teaches us something. That any success you hope to achieve in this life, or the life to come is only possible if Allah makes it possible. That's for you, O son of Adam. Allah said about you, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا and The human has been created weak. The human, meaning every human. The insan, every human. And if you're weak, you will not be able to lift, you will not be able to carry the burden. So then, what is your duty? If you want to carry the burden, if you want to succeed, if you want to achieve, your duty is to turn to Allah and ask His help. This is a central message in Islam. It is so central that Allah has made this the heart and core of Surah Al Fatiha. The middle verses of Surah Al Fatiha are Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. It is you that we worship. And it is you whose help we seek. And the Fatiha is the heart and core of the prayer. The prayer is repeated five times a day, containing 17 units, 17 rak'ahs. In other words, we're being taught to renew this bond between ourselves and Allah, the bond between the weak and the strong, the bond between the needy and the all-powerful bond between the seeker and the giver the bond between the poor and the generous renew that bond of slave of allah if you hope to achieve success in any of your endeavors for it is only allah who grants success the author then says As'alullah al-kareem. i ask allah the benevolent the lord of the great throne that he grants you his allegiance in this worldly life and in the hereafter. To become your guardian in this worldly life, in the hereafter. Sheikh begins his dua, or rather begins his treatise with dua. And then he begins his dua with praising Allah by his beautiful names. And his lofty attributes. And this is one of the secrets and keys to success with dua, and that is to begin it with asking Allah by his beautiful names. Because Allah commanded us to do so. 
and to Allah belong the most beautiful of names. So call upon him by them, meaning by those names, those most beautiful names. So Allah Azza wa Jalla loves to be called upon with his names. And if you do that which Allah loves, you're more likely to get an answer. And then notice that he began his treatise with making dua for you. Clear signal of his care and the mercy that he has as a teacher for his students, the mercy that he has as a Muslim for his brothers and sisters in Islam, the mercy that he has for people generally as he addresses them with four principles that help establish the Tawheed in their hearts and save them from shirk. Which, as he explains, and we shall see, inshallah, in this book, the greatest of all objectives and the loftiest of all victories. Establish the Tawheed in your heart and escape from shirk. And what did he call upon Allah asking for? That Allah become your guardian. That Allah form an allegiance with you and take you as an ally in this life and in the life to come. Here's a quick question. If Allah chooses you as an Allah, and He chooses to become your guardian in this life and the life to come, what else do you need? Is there anything missing that perhaps you could be looking for and need to make further dua to attain it? Those who said nothing left, that is correct. This is a, a gathering dua. Contains all the benefit that a human could possibly want. Then he goes on and he makes further dua. He says, he said, and that Allah make you blessed wherever you may be. And that he make you from those whom when they are given, they are grateful. When they are tested, they are patient. And when they sin, they seek forgiveness. For indeed, these three things are a headline of happiness, title of happiness. If you wish uh, a looser translation the entryway, the pathway to happiness. The first of these, he said that he make you blessed wherever you may be. And that is the description of those who follow the prophets. Allah Jalla Ala said about Isa ibn Maryam that he said about himself, وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتْ وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَةِ and he made me blessed wherever I may be. And he entrusted to me the matter of the prayer. To be blessed wherever you may be. If you're in the marketplace, you're blessed, you're beneficial. If you're at home with your family, you're blessed, you're beneficial. If you're in the masjid, you're blessed, you're beneficial. It necessitates that you must have knowledge. Knowledge that will guide you to Please Allah and benefit his creation. Knowledge of how to conduct yourself in all these different situations and others. This is why the only people who attain that level, the level of being blessed wherever they may be, are the seekers of knowledge. May Allah make us all from those who seek knowledge. He said, that he make you from those who, when they are given, they are grateful. This is one. And when they are tested, they are patient. This is two. And when they sin, they seek forgiveness. This is three. And then he said about these three things. They are the title, the headline, the pathway, the entryway to happiness. Happiness is the goal of every human. There's not a single human that is pursuing anything but happiness. Every move we make in this life, whether it is to escape a pain, 
or seek a comfort or a pleasure, be it small or big, is in reality pursuit of happiness. However, true happiness, lasting happiness, is something that Allah has chosen to hide from the majority of the people of the world. And instead, He made it exclusive to the people of Iman, faith, and righteous deeds. Allah said, من عمل منكم صالحا من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة. Whoever performs righteous deeds from among from amongst you, male or female, whilst a believer, then surely we will grant him a goodly life. This is the life of happiness. This is the life that the Sahaba lived. May Allah be pleased with them. This is the life the prophets and the messengers lived. This is the life that the scholars lived. They've lived in the past and continue to live it today. And this is the life of everyone who fulfills these two criteria. Binding between faith and righteous deeds. Good knowledge, sound knowledge, along with upright actions. Iman wal amal salih. And the author, in these three du'as that he made for you, the three things that he called the title of happiness, has summarized for you the path to happiness, along with asking Allah to grant you to walk that path. But what is that path in summary? We learn it from here. When Allah gives you, you show gratitude. When Allah tests you, you show patience. And if you sin, you ask for forgiveness. These three things cover the entirety of the human life from the moment you are born until the moment you pass away. Every single situation you will experience, you will encounter, is going to fall into one of these three categories. There is nothing else. A human does not go through anything but these three things. Every amenity is due gratitude. Every blessing requires results in gratitude. If you fulfill the right of Allah Azzawajal to show gratitude, then you have completed one of the pillars of happiness. Every test from Allah Azzawajal requires patience. Patience is obligatory. It is not option. There is a higher level than patience, and that is acceptance and pleasure. Accepting and being pleased with whatever Allah has decreed, even the painful decree, that is higher than patience. That is option, meaning it is supererogatory. There's no sin on someone who cannot reach that level, the level of being happy with the decree of Allah, even when it's painful. But patience is required. Patience is an obligation. So a man who is patient in the face of the trials and tribulations, the tests of Allah Taala, has fulfilled the obligation here as well. And then finally, when we fail, to either show gratitude where gratitude is due, or be patient where patience is due, and we sin, then we immediately rectify what is between us and Allah through seeking Allah's forgiveness. In that case, you have completed the circle of happiness. If you live by these three rules, you will instantly become a happy person. I ask Allah to make me and you all from the people of happiness. Now, gratitude is three parts, three components. There's the gratitude of the heart feeling of gratefulness that you experience in your heart. Basically an admission between you and yourself that whatever you are enjoying, whatever you are taking for granted, whatever you are experiencing from amenities and blessings is all from Allah. Number two is expressing that openly with your tongue, attributing all the gifts of Allah to Allah. 
instead of the way of the kuffar, for example, who attribute the gifts of Allah to themselves. They say, oh, this is because of my intelligence, or I got this because of my uh, skills, or education, or perseverance, or grit, or, or, or. Or they attribute it to others. They say, oh, this is because so-and-so did such and such. Sometimes they will attribute the gifts of Allah, the most lowly of the creation. For example, they will say things like, if it was not for the dog, the thieves would have come into the house last night. Basically, they're saying that the dog barked loud and woke them up and scared the thieves away. But in reality, all of this should be attributed to Allah Taala. Every blessing is from Him, Azza wa Jal. So if you want to mention something about the factors that you see that Allah has put in place, mention it after you admit that it is from Allah. So you can say something like, if it was not for the blessing of Allah, then for the dog waking up and barking, then the thieves would have done such and such. For example, number two, basically is to admit the blessings of Allah Azza wa with your tongue. This is a component of gratitude. Lastly, number three, third component of the three components of gratitude is to use your limbs to show gratitude to Allah Azza wa to Apply your limbs in actions that please your Lord Jalla wa'ala. Primary amongst things that please him are the obligations that he has placed upon you. And from these obligations is to use his blessings in a way that pleases him. To give you an example, if you want to show Allah gratitude that Allah has given you sight, then use your sight to look at the things that please Allah. Look at the Mus'haf. Look at the books of the people of knowledge. Sit down in the masjid and look at the face of your teachers and scholars. Look at the creation of Allah and wonder, and puzzle over its beauty and splendor. Over signs that he has left all around you, the mountains, and the clouds, the rivers, the trees, the flowers, the bees and the birds. Use your eyes. To please him, Azza wa and certainly do not use them when things that are sinful, haram, things that distance you from Allah Jalla wa'ala. This is how you complete gratitude. From the evidence that show that gratitude is not just what is in the heart. It's the statement of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala where he said, I'malu ala Dawood shukra wa qalilun min ibadi al-shukur. Apply yourselves in actions, O family of Dawood, out of gratitude. Few of my slaves are the grateful. And few of my slaves are the grateful. Allah has just said to them, what? Apply yourselves in actions. I'malu. Perform good deeds. Perform righteous deeds. Ala Dawood shukra. Out of gratitude. Then he said with Abtulia Saba, if he is tested, he is patient. Ibtila is either being tested or being tried. Being tested means to be tested with the commandments of Allah. Do and don't do. An example of the word ibtila being used in this fashion is the statement of Allah. وَإِذِي بِتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتِ mention when your Lord tested Ibrahim with words, so he completed them. Then Allah said, I'm going to make you a leader to mankind, a role model. So Allah rewarded him for following the commandments of Allah wa Taala by making him a leader to the righteous, to the people upon goodness, a role model. So the word ibtila is used to mean what? 
being tested with the commandments of Allah. The other is being tested with trials, such as sickness, such as disease, such as poverty, such as the death of loved ones, painful trials, trials of pain, that Allah will extract from you patience. An example of the word being used this way, Allah Azza just said, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And indeed, we shall test you with some fear, some hunger, and a reduction of fruits, souls, wealth. Uh, I think I changed the order. It's wealth first. And give glad tidings to the patient. Let the patient know that good news is on the horizon. This is an example of that word being used to indicate trials. Patience covers all of this. You need patience both to fulfill the commandments in both their categories, do and don't do, and also to withstand the painful trials of this life. So patience in reality can then be categorized into three categories. Patience to perform what Allah has commanded. Patience to abstain from what Allah has forbidden. And patience to persevere in the face of painful trials. These are the three types of patience. Finally, he said, And if he commits a sin, he asks Allah for forgiveness. And Allah Azza wa is one that forgives. And he loves to forgive. In fact, he created a category of beings, the angels, that doesn't sin. But he, Azza wa Jal, chose to create us as sinners. And he let us know by way of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the reason he created us, susceptible to sin. What is that reason? Because he wants to forgive. He wants to be known as one that forgives. He wants it to be known that he's capable of punishing, but chooses to forgive. He wants us to worship him through the knowledge of the fact that he is forgiving. So we turn to him. We raise our hands to the heavens. And we say, oh Allah, forgive us. For indeed you are forgiving. He loves to be known. And that aspect, that attribute, that description of Allah Azza wa Jal is not known in full till there are sinners who he then forgives. Then Allah is known in full as Al Ghafur, the often forgiving. And this completes the commentary on this dua. Now, before we move on, it is interesting to note this particular dua is the exact same dua found in the introduction to one of the books of the Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim. Perhaps some of you know which book I'm referring to. If you do, mention it to us. And by the way, uh, while you are typing your answers, I want to say Jazakum Allah Khayyan to the brothers and sisters who are sharing some of the benefits in the, uh, in the chat for others to uh, benefit from them. The, the book I'm referring to is Al-Wabil Al-Sayyib wa Rafi' Al-Kalim Al-Tayyib by Ibn Al-Qayyim. The book about dhikr, the remembrance of Allah and dua. In the introduction to that book, he made the same dua. And this kind of uh, highlights two things. It highlights how the scholars take from one another. In reality, this is a blessed chain of knowledge passed down from generation to generation. 
the chain, if you follow it upwards, it links you all the way back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're learning from the scholars of the Sunnah. Scholars of the Millah, of the Deen of Allah, Azza wa They will always inevitably change you, uh, connect you, link you to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Their knowledge has been passed down to them from those before them. And so on and so forth in a chain leading back to the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two, how in order to become a scholar, you need to learn from the scholars, read their books, go through their works, jot down the benefits, highlight the things that are worthy of remembering, in fact, memorizing. Put in the effort, go through the works of the people of knowledge. Just as an example, Al Imam Ibn al Qayyim, rahimahullah, who we just spoke about, is one of those scholars that the people of knowledge recommend that all his books should be read. All his books are recommended reading. You should go through the entire library of Ibn Qayyim and not skip a single page. And you will benefit tremendously. Obviously, this doesn't mean that you should jump at it uh, without any game plan, without any particular structure or organization, without having the help of a teacher. But generally, uh, this is a library that you want to benefit from in its entirety. Something that you will benefit from tremendously if you go through that entire library. I would not be surprised. If Sheikh Islam Muhammad al had gone through the entire library of Ibn Qayyim, at least everything that he could get his hands on. Likewise, Ibn Taymiyyah. Then the author, he said after this introduction, I'lam ashadaka Allahu li ta'ati. Innal hanifiyya, millata Ibrahim, an ta'abud Allah wahdahu mukhlisan lahu al-deen. Wa bithalika amara Allahu jami'a al-nas wa khalaqahum laha. كما قال تعالى وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون. He said no. K N O W. Learn. In other words, be certain of what I'm going to tell you next. This is a word the scholars use to grab your attention and make you realize what is coming next is something that you have to be certain of. May Allah guide you to His obedience. May Allah guide you to His obedience. In other words, may Allah guide you to applying the knowledge. That al Hanifiya, the religion of Ibrahim, is that you worship Allah alone, making your deen entirely devoted to Him, sincerely devoted to Him. And it is this that Allah has commanded all of mankind with and created them for it. As Allah lofty as He said, and I have not created jinn kind and mankind except to worship me. The author here, may Allah have mercy upon him, is teaching us in a second introduction about al hanifi explaining along the way that al hanifi is the reason for our existence. Someone wants to say to you, why are you here? The answer is to establish al hanifi And what is that? To worship Allah alone without partners, to devote myself to Allah, to make my whole life about Allah, every moment of my wakeful hours and my sleep for Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now, from the Quran, we see some evidence highlighting the beauty of Al-Hanifiya and the requirement that Allah has placed upon all creation to follow it. An example of that is Allah Azza wa Jalla saying, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ دِينًا مِمَّنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ اتَّبَعَ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Who has a more beautiful religion than one who has submitted their face to Allah? Yani they have turned and faced the direction of the pleasure of Allah and complete, completely embraced that path and submitted themselves to the pursuit of that path. 
whilst in a state of graciousness, meaning that they are doing so, observing Allah's pleasure, Azza wa Jal, worshipping Allah as though they see Allah. وَاتَّبَعَ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا And follow the religion of Ibrahim as a Hanif. And then Allah said, وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا And Allah has chosen Ibrahim as a Khalil. Now, what is Al-Khalil? What does the word Khalil mean? Allah has chosen Ibrahim as a Khalil. What is Al-Khalil? Al-Khalil is one that is beloved to Allah. However, love in the Arabic language is expressed by many, many words. Amongst these words is al-mahabba. Mahabba is love. Mawadda. Mawadda is love. Miqa. Miqa is love. There's many words that express love in Arabic. And the word khulla is the most powerful of these words. Scholars of the language, they say, comes from a tahallul. Tahallul is when something permeates through another. It goes into every part of another. This is why khulla is derived from these letters, from the letters of a tahallul. Why? Because they say, when the love reaches that point, then the love has taken hold of the heart such that every part of the heart is filled with the love of the beloved. So Al-Khalil is not just someone you love, rather someone whose love has taken hold of your heart. So if you are fortunate to be so loving of Allah, جل, that Allah is your Khalil, then indeed your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken over the entirety of your heart. In the case of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam, Allah has chosen him as a khalil. Allah has chosen him as a khalil. Allah has expressed for all humanity that Ibrahim has reached a level with Allah. Allah loves him so much that he is his khalil. And based on the evidence of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we only know of two men who have ever reached that level with Allah. Allah has loved them to that extent. Who are these two men? Ibrahim is one of them. We just read the evidence right now. وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Who is the other man that has reached that level with Allah? This is one question. Simple. That's the correct answer. Jazakumullah khair. The second question is... Why? Why finish this ayah with وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا And Allah has chosen Ibrahim as a Khalil. Now, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the answer to the first question, the answer is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the second man who has reached that level. And the evidence is in the Sunnah, where he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, revealing this fact to his companions, he said, However, Allah has chosen your companion as a Khalil, referring to himself as their companion. He said to them, Allah has chosen me, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu as a Khalil. To give you a hint, the first part of the, of the ayah is about center. That's a good answer. This is the correct answer. The first part of the ayah is highlighting a path. Highlighting a path. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a path to take and follow, especially that that path requires the fulfillment of certain criteria, and the performance of certain duties, then usually people need what? They need an incentive. 
motivate them, to make them want to follow that path. So the incentive comes immediately afterwards. After you are told to follow the path of Ibrahim and his religion as a Hanif, then you are told what the result is. The result is that you are following the path causes Allah's love for you to grow. As for the man who perfected the following of that path, Ibrahim, he reached the level of Allah's love that only two men in history have ever reached. In other words, you follow that path. You're on the ultimate path. You follow that path. Then your path to success is guaranteed. And based upon how much you're willing to put in, how much effort you're willing to expend, you will get and reap <coughs> the rewards of your efforts. So this is from the first of the evidence that we have highlighting what the author is talking about, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the path of al hanifiyya the religion of Ibrahim. Hanifiyya, in the language, is a reference to Al-Hanaf. Al-Hanaf is leaning, leaning or bending. And this is why a person who has bent legs, his legs are bent like this, it's called Ahnaf. Call him Ahnaf, from the word Hanaf, because of the bend in his legs. In the Sharia, al hanifiyya means to lean away from shirk. And by default, that means to lean towards a tawheed, towards Allah. This is the meaning of al hanifiyya Always lean towards Allah. Always lean away from shirk. Inshallah, we conclude with this uh, point. And bi ta'ala, we will pick up from here the next time we meet. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم ربا انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما تنفعنا به ربنا آتي نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها وليها ومولاها ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسن في الآخرة حسنة إن عذاب النار Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah we meet again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.